Hello, everyone, and welcome to episode 17 of Love Field Stories, presented by Dallas Love Field Airport. I'm Bruce Bleakley, aviation consultant, historian, and co-author of The Love Evolution, a centennial celebration of Love Field Airport and its art. And with me today, again, for our second episode is Harriet Baskets, a brilliant writer of all things uh, travel, who has been featured on USA Today, NBC News, CNBC, and others, and uh, has a blog, stuckattheairport.com, an in-depth guide to airports and airport amenities. So if you've ever been stuck at the airport, or if you're stuck at one right now, she's probably written about that airport on her blog. And Harriet, we've been uh, talking about the history of Love Field and some of the interesting things that have happened here uh, at Love Field Airport. And uh, you were uh, you had a couple of questions from uh, the book that uh, I co-authored with uh, th three other people here in the city of Dallas from the Office of Cultural Affairs and from the airport staff. Yeah. Uh, so in this book, and you can see I've been um, <laughs> tagging it. Um, there's, there's a page I was um, surprised and pleased to read that Alexander Calder has a connection to Love Field Airport. Uh, that's correct. Um, once, uh, once the uh, major airlines moved to DFW International Airport after it opened in 1974, Braniff uh, Airways kept its big maintenance hangar here at Love Field. And uh, in 1975, excuse me, 1973, they were going to celebrate the uh, 25th anniversary of their inauguration of South American service. And to do that, they decided to do a special paint job on one of their DC-8 aircraft. And they had Alexander Calder, uh, they commissioned Alexander Calder to design that paint job and uh, that would be for the aircraft that would be called the Flying Colors of South America. And uh, th that aircraft was painted at their big maintenance hangar here at Love Field Airport. So uh, the airplane came in as a regular with a regular brand of paint job and exited about uh, three months later as the Flying Colors of, S of South America. Um, Calder didn't paint the entire aircraft by hand himself. What he did was he painted, uh, hand painted some of the portions of the lower uh, parts of the airplane, and he had done a complete paint job on a large scale model, which the, uh, the maintenance people then used as a guide to paint the uh, entire aircraft. You know, it seems like today, or probably even then, somebody, an artist of that stature, if he was commissioned to make a design for an airplane um, livery, I guess, or a paint job, um, might draw it and send it over. But he was actually there, right? He was he was there on the spot, and he was there every day to supervise the whole operation. Uh, Brown bagged his lunch and, and the whole thing, stayed out at the hangar all day and making sure that he was done to uh, the way he wanted. And then uh, two years later, in preparation for the nation's bicentennial, uh, they uh, Braniff Airways commissioned Calder again to paint this time a Boeing 727 uh, in the paint scheme that would be patriotic. And so it was called the Flying Colors of the United States. And it kind of was an abstract of uh, the, uh, uh, red, white and blue waving in the breeze like an American flag as it flew along. And again, he uh, supervised the whole operation there at the Brana, the old branch of maintenance hangar there at Love Field, which, by the way, that maintenance hangar is still there. And uh, it's, it's now being used as a uh, commercial or rather a uh, uh, corporate aircraft uh, operation. And uh, it's been refurbished uh, up to modern standards. But but that was kind of a big art related story here in the history of Love Field. So. So I don't know if it's in your book or in a conversation we had, but you said he didn't only paint the airplane. No. Talked about <laughs> he, there was one story that, uh, you know, one of the, uh, as I said, he brown bagged his lunch. And on, when he was working on the first airplane, the DC-8, uh, everybody, all the maintenance guys took their lunch break. Uh, so uh, Calder sat down, uh, leaned up against one of the main landing gear wheels and opened up his brown bag with his peanut butter and jelly sandwich or whatever it was. And he noticed he was sitting next to a, a 
mechanic's toolbox. And so with with just one hand, he dipped in, he had his palette close by and he just dipped in and started painting this guy's uh, toolbox. And he put an abstract design all around the top and sides of this fellow's toolbox. So when the mechanic came back after lunch, uh, luckily for him, he realized what he had. And I think later on, he sold it to an art museum for $1,500. That doesn't sound like much today, but back in the mid-70s, that would have been a pretty good, uh, uh, pretty good sum. So, so those pla those um, designs on those planes no longer exist. Right? Unfortunately, no. Neither aircraft uh, exists in that same livery anymore. But do you have a model in the We museum? have uh, at the Frontiers of Flight Museum on the southeast corner of Love Field, which, by the way, is the only place you can buy a copy of that book. Uh, so, um, which I should mention, since it was kind of a uh, short and, and uh, uh, limited edition uh, publication. <clears throat> but uh, at the Frontiers of Flight Museum, there is a model of a large scale model of the DC-8, the flying colors of South America. Great. Along with a big, a big whole Braniff gallery. So I love that Alexander Calder is, uh, was there and people got to meet him and like regular people working at the airport got to hang out with him. Um, but the art that he made there no longer exists except on some models. Um, but you do have art, lots of art that's still around, it seems like. Absolutely. The, uh, the, the airport has a very aggressive public art program. And uh, it's professionally curated, has almost 30 installations uh, now that I can think of. And it was back when they were building the what's now the current, current terminal uh, in the late 1950s uh, that the first piece of public art, the inlaid terrazzo world map that's inlaid into the floor of the lobby was installed. And this, you know, is beautiful. Um, it's like 42 feet across. And it's absolutely gorgeous. Uh, it's and it's quite interesting uh, to to go look at it because when you get a chance, which it's in the the area where you show your boarding pass and go to the TSA line. So unfortunately, you can't see it unless you're going to get on an airplane. But to uh, look at the world as it was in 1957 when the artist inlaid the map and compare it to what it is now is a real lesson in geopolitics and history uh, with, uh, for instance, you, you see what uh, used to be Burma is now Myanmar, uh, all the differences in the various countries in, Fran uh, in uh, uh, Africa, Africa. Yeah. and Eastern Europe. Uh, you know, so it's, 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 it's really fascinating if you, and, and you can stop and look at it without being trampled by a bunch of people if you, if you have the time. So they never went back and put like stickers over the names with the new names. Right? Yeah, no, I don't think they're going to do that. <laughs> so, but um, I noticed in your book, you talk about it in the book and you say in the book that there's one city name that's misspelled, but you mm -hmm. don't say what city that is. And I wonder if that's a secret. No, it's not a secret. It's kind of just a little funny story around here. Uh, but the the name of the city that's misspelled is Philadelphia. It's missing the second L. And um, at first, you know, when people first hear that, they think, well, you know, the artist's name was Luigi Flaviano. They probably brought him over from Italy and he didn't quite understand the, you know, the spelling or whatever. No, that's not it at all. Luigi Flaviano was born in Oklahoma City and grew up in going to uh, American public schools. It's it's just an honest mistake, you know. So, but uh, but it's kind of fun. And and no, it isn't because of the uh, intense rivalry between the Philadelphia Eagles and the Dallas Cowboys football teams because there weren't any Dallas Cowboys in 1957. So, at least not as a football team. Well, I love that we have this little secret here for the for people who watch the podcast. So right. That's great. Um, so so that's one of the early ones. But then I remember coming to the airport when the I guess the I think of it as the new terminal, but it was the mm. renovated terminal, I guess. Mm. And one of the things that they that we spent the whole day was touring the airport and all the artwork that had been installed. Is that when it all came? Yeah, uh, most of it. Uh, there were some other art pieces. The huge, uh, there's a huge uh, sculpture outside the airport uh, as you drive up along Herb Kelleher Way toward the terminal called the Spirit of Flight. 
that was a, a gift from, uh, and it was uh, uh, by the uh, sculptor Charles Umloft, not a gift from him, but uh, it was a gift to the airport uh, in 1961. And then there were uh, other pieces, but the most, uh, the most activity has come in the last, say, 20 years <clears throat> and from about 2003 on. And the and, and uh, public art, uh, there was a large public art segment of that Love Field modernization program that took place over an eight to ten year period uh, just a little while back. And it's still ongoing today. There is a uh, brand new art installation at the airport entrance that was just installed, as a matter of fact. That's great. So many airports, it's part of what makes an airport a special place. It is. Um, that it, that airports commission art that's a site specific, um, that has something, a lot of them have something to do with the history of the airport. So mm -hmm. I know so much of that art is very uh, site specific and connected, like those metal trees that mm -hmm. are in the um, what do you call that? Uh, I think of it as a little garden. It, it is. It's a, it's a little relatively quiet area just outside. It's enclosed by high walls. So a lot of the jet noise doesn't get to you. You can go out there and there are concrete benches. And uh, the artist, uh, Sherry Owens is her name, uh, has created a sort of uh, a memory of Lieutenant Mossley Love uh, for who the airport is named. And uh, he was a World War I aviator. Uh, not excuse me he was not a world war one aviator he was a pre-world war one aviator that had perished in the line of duty in 1913 and when love field uh, was dedicated as an army flying training field in 1917 uh, the tradition was to name the the new flying fields after army aviators that had perished in the line of duty his name was next on the list and so what she, uh, she's done is created a little garden, actually a grouping of 12 foot high bronze crepe myrtle trees. And in one area, there's an army camp stool with a bronze representation of his flying jacket, leather helmet, goggles, uh, and scar and uh, gloves, excuse me. And it's entitled Back in a Moment, like he's just laid his flying gear down from, and he's going to be back in a moment, but unfortunately, he didn't come back. And that's pre-security, right? Uh, yes, you can, There's yes. And most of the public art is pre-security, uh, so, which is a really good thing. Uh, yeah. And as I said, you can, you can access that particular little area uh, from a door right next to the ticketing wing uh, in the terminal building. And isn't there also a um, like a glass uh, a glass piece of art that has his image in it? Yes, there's um, uh, just uh, at, before you exit the secure area, and you can actually see it from a plate glass window overlooking the secure area in the non-secure part of the terminal. Is a long uh, mural style installation in glass called a Blueprint of Flight that includes some poetry and some other uh, reminiscences of flying, and it includes an image of Lieutenant Love, which is pretty accurate to, if you see a, to his uh, one of the few photographs we have of him as a young cavalry officer in 1901. So, Great. So people who maybe don't know why it's named after him can then see it and learn about see it. That. Yeah, right. Like they'll that. see it yeah. there. So um, another um, thing that I, I, um, I can't remember the name of it now, um, there's a kind of a ceiling oh. thing where that has a lot of images or, or pieces of different right. aviation things. What is yeah, that? Yeah, the artists call it a torus. It's like a big skinny donut <laughs> wire mesh uh, and embedded in that wire mesh are thousands and thousands and thousands, literally, of uh, small metal objects that represent some sort of flying thing. Birds, aircraft, hot air balloons, uh, dra uh, flying dragons, uh, dandelions, you know, what, uh, you know, anything that moves through the air or myth mythologically moves through the air is up there somehow. It's, it, uh, it's really neat. It is on the uh, secure side. You can only see it uh, when you're in the passenger concourse, but it's, uh, it's really quite, a, quite an interesting piece of art. It seems like the kind of thing if you're traveling with kids 
who are oh. kind of antsy that you could say, see how many you can identify. Right. Yeah. So, and, and I wanted to ask, is there also a place for kids at the airport? Yes, there, there is. As a matter of fact, it's a, it's a, an area inside the secure area. As you go up the uh, passenger concourse is shaped like a T uh, the stem of the T goes up toward the East and West concourses with 10 gates each uh, along the stem of the T on the left side, as you move toward the, uh, passenger concourse uh, is an area called the Little Love Lounge, and it's it's themed with the Dallas Mavericks basketball team uh, in their colors. It had we have a, we have a really great relationship at the airport with the Dallas Mavericks. Level two of one of the parking garages, Garage C, is all painted by a local muralist and graffiti artist named Tex Moton. Uh, in Dallas Mavericks colors and slogans and everything like that, these shades of blue and gray and white. And in this area, the Little Love Lounge, they've even, they even have basketball hoops. Uh, they have a place where you, you can compare your wingspan with the wingspan of one of the stars of our basketball team uh, and do a selfies there and, and other things that, are, that will keep kids interested. So, yes, there's a neat little place for that. And it's kind of a little a bit of an art installation in itself, even though right. it's not part of the official public art program. It's pretty artsy. I think when I first visited, it was like a lot of other airports, which is fine, um, had um, like little airplanes that you could sit in and things like that. So it's yeah. great that it has a very local connection now. That's mm -hmm. great. Now, there's also another thing. We talked about the floor with the map. But there's a floor, uh, is it terrazzo, that has um, yes. birds in it? It has uh, the artist's, um, uh, Paul Mariani is his name, the artist uh, inlaid to, into terrazzo, inlaid using recycled colored glass. Um, it, it's uh, uh, representations of 27 birds that are native to the state of Texas and, and uh, as they appear in flight with, with their wings spread. And that's on a walkway going from the second level of the uh, uh, non-secure area, which we call the Love Landing, uh, out to the sky bridge that leads to parking garage A and parking garage B. So. Another great thing with kids, I would it think. Is, it is. They can go and say, oh, look at this bird. Look at this bird. This bird. Yes. And then so. the, the other um, piece of art, and there's so many of them, but the other one, uh, one, I guess, last piece of art I wanted to ask about was the stained glass, which seems a little bit different. The, the, the framed stained glass. Yeah, they're they're called the Celestery windows and they're from a church, a historic church in uh, in downtown near downtown Dallas that was going to be demolished. Uh, and uh, the at the time. People weren't necessarily thinking about the airport, but the Office of Cultural Affairs, as I understand, um, for the city decided we've got to, to preserve these really beautiful stained glass windows. And so they did. And then uh, uh, there's another artist that has subsequently put a, a metal exterior frame around each one of them to stabilize them so they're nice and uh, you know, preserved and, and rigid so they won't flex and crack. And then, uh, then they th thought that would be a great place uh, with, to display these in the ticketing wing of the terminal building, so people can enjoy them because they're they're really phenomenal pieces of, uh, of stained glass art. That's great. So. So I know I keep asking about like things that are already there, but I bet there's new things coming to your airport. There's there there are uh, as a matter of fact, and and one of the ways we we try to keep uh, the the airport tries to keep. Uh, uh, people uh, involved and, and uh, educated about that. Lovefield has a, a, a good neighbor program with quarterly meetings, and it's a, it's kind of a information to the community type of thing. Right now, of course, we're uh, up to now. We've been doing them uh, virtually. We'll see how when we go back to in-person meetings. But uh, the uh, airport director, the rather the director of aviation, and members of his staff will talk about you know, this, this is coming up, this is coming up. And right now, if, for instance, if you drive into Love Field, uh, you'll notice there's a lot of work being done on the entrance and on the road, main road leading up to the terminal, which is called Herb Kelleher Way after the co-founder of South uh, Southwest Airlines. And uh, 
uh, and it's making uh, making it more accessible. There's b improved pedestrian access throughout uh, uh, in in the uh, on the grounds of the airport, and as a matter of fact, all the way around the airport on the outside. Because another thing that the airport is trying to do is is coordinating with neighborhood Im uh, improvement projects that are being uh, done by someone else but to coordinate with that effort and uh, so so that the boulevards that run along the sides of the uh, uh, airport are nice and pedestrian friendly and traffic friendly and that sort of thing so those things are going on um, uh, we have a couple of new hangars for business jet, uh, aviation that are going up on the north end of the field. Uh, the Right now, uh, for the last several months, as a matter of fact, we've been limited to operation on just one of our two parallel runways. While they refurbish the runway on the west side of the field, it's been a long time since that's uh, that's been reworked. It was originally built in the middle 60s. It had gone through some refurbishment in the past, but it's been, uh, as I understand, almost 30 years since that happened. They're about to finish with that, thank goodness. Mm -hmm. And um, and uh, sometime this summer, we had, should have that uh, airport back or that airfield runway back in operation. And uh, that goes along with, of course, you know, that means there was more noise on the east side of the airport for quite a while. So I'm sure that the residents who live across the street on the east side will be glad to, when that happens. But and, and that brings up another thing that is uh, part of the Good Neighbor program as well. We try to keep uh, the residents of the surrounding communities up to speed on what's happening with uh, noise abatement uh, efforts and that sort of thing. There are uh, noise sensors located in various places to make sure that we comply with uh, that. And uh, also there's a voluntary program where we don't, uh, the uh, airlines don't fly late at night, super early in the morning. So it's, while oh, it's strictly nice. voluntary, it still fits in with their flight schedules from now on. So. I like that it's called good neighbor because you do need it, to be a good neighbor. Absolutely. We well, yeah. and and you know what? I think the city's real smart in that, uh, and and uh, recalling that it's a city-owned airport. I think the city is really smart in that way because uh, I've been involved with a lot of airports uh, in a couple of times as an employee or a tenant, and that's that's something you really really have to do. Uh, you, you, so it, it, to to keep peace in the family and. and keep a good operation going. Um, and then there's some discussion, possibly it's down the road a bit. Maybe we might have a second entrance to the airport as we've been getting busier and busier. Uh, you know, some people think that might be a good thing, but uh, logistically that's a, might be a challenge. So we'll see how that works out there. They've got some people working on that. And, uh, and that's one of the things that comes up at these good neighbor program uh, meetings. So. Okay. Well, I've learned well, a lot today. Well, uh, and as a matter of fact, I, we're, we're, we've been uh, so glad to have you with us. I, and I wanted to make sure that our uh, podcast, one of the things that our podcast viewers know is that um, uh, Seattle is a destination that's easily accessible from Love Field. And if you go to Seattle, uh, that you have written a book uh, that's about to be published, called it's called 111 places in seattle you must not miss mm -hmm. and it's coming out in uh july hopefully if there's no uh, supply chain issues with paper i guess uh -huh. um, okay. but it's all about the airport is in it and um king county airport it is in it and a lot of aviation history spots around town is in it okay cool and and yes i remember there's what with Boeing and not only Boeing, but other things, there's a lot of aviation history in the Seattle area. Uh, but that's not the first book you've written. As a matter of fact, uh, you have a, a book named after uh, the same as your blog. Yes. Stuck I'll, at the I'll show it to you. I don't show it to anybody, but this came out in 2001. This came out eight weeks before 9-11. Oh, my gosh. Um, and the paper is like all kind of you can see it's all like. But um, but yeah, so before there were blogs. Um, I had, I mean, nobody now would take a guidebook with them 
of the airport. <laughs> you would pull it up on your phone. But yeah. it was one of the first guidebooks to airports, and it was really yeah. fun. And it was how I learned a lot of history about airports. Well, it's Harriet, it's been great having you with us on uh, our podcast, Love Field Stories. And uh, we hope everyone will tune in again uh, for the next episode of Love Field Stories. And until then, Harriet, thank you so much for being with us. Thank and you for doing this with me. It's fun. You bet. And, and good flying and, uh, and good luck. Thanks.